And it's fun to be co-hosting this with Dana, so you don't have to listen to me talk for an hour and a half alone. Uh, and she's lots of fun, and we're good friends. So it should be a good time. Also, thank you to Austin Lambert and Runge Nature Center and the staff there for helping us coordinate all the logistics and hosting our webinar. It is so appreciated. And um, to Austin, especially for fielding our questions, and to Sam for playing our songs due to audio issues. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to start off with a topic that's very important to me and hopefully to you uh, and most folks in the ornithological community right now. So birds need our help. So last year there was a large uh, scientific study. I won't bore you too much with data and studies right off the bat, um, but there was an article in the journal Science, um, so a large um, popular study. Uh, peer-reviewed study that talked about the decline of North American avifauna. It, it, it quantified the number of birds we've lost since 1970, and it's about 2.9 billion birds, uh, rounded to about 3 billion birds, and 29% of our North American avifauna have been lost since 1970. So very shocking, um, kind of slaps us in the face. You know, ornithologists have known that declines have been occurring, but this paper really added quantification to it and so it with a number. And it's so it's just very shocking, and it's kind of rocked. Um, both the public and the ornithological community. It's kind of all hands on deck scrambling to figure out where the survival bottlenecks are. Of course, it's many, many species, and so it's a lot to handle. Um, but this is a graphic from the study, and it shows that our largest group of birds that are declining are grassland birds due to myriad reasons for all of these different species. And so the ornithological, ornithological community, again, is kind of scrambling. This is a crisis of the taxa um, of all these birds declining. So while I don't mean to start off on a really depressing note, I try to take all opportunities when speaking to the public to talk about this, just so people know that it's occurring. Uh, and if you can help or are able to help, um, how to chip in and kind of help our birds. So when this paper came out, there was about a year of planning of marketing before the paper was published using marketing folks, not biologists, but people who know how to convey these messages. Um, and so they put together infographics and a website, 3billionbirds.org. That's the number 3billionbirds.org. Austin, maybe you could put that in the chat for us. Please, please, thank you. Um, and that outlines some of these infographics. It gives more information on the bird declines. Uh, and it also asks people to um, do some things to help birds. So they have these beautiful infographics that really sum up the data. And again, these kind of surprising ways of how many birds are actually gone. And then the North American Bird Conservation Initiative has put together infographics about why we should even care about this. Why do we care that birds are declining? Well, they support clean water. They're good for the economy. Bird watchers spend a ton of money. They're pest control. Um, they eat four to 500 uh, tons of insects per year. Just imagine if all those insects were all around us all the time without birds eating them. <laughs> Uh, birds and their habitats support your health, as does the outdoors and spending time outdoors and bird watching. And they boost property values. And if you care more about wine and coffee, they do stuff for that, too. Um, they really allow a lot of our ag uh, nationwide to occur because of how many insects they eat and uh, pollination and seed dispersal. So the community really came together to try and tell people why should they should care about this. So a lot of people see these numbers and these declines and they think, well, what the heck can little old me do? Well, there are little things that all of us together can do and start doing today um, to help our birds. And in mass, it will make a difference. So they came up with seven simple actions to help birds. There's more information about this and resources and links and lots of information on that 3billionbirds.org website. So I'd like to focus on three main ones, which are plant native plants, shrubs and trees on your property. Uh, prevent window strikes. If you have a window where a few birds die every single year, put something on it because that adds up. And across the nation, it's one of the leading causes of bird mortality is our windows on our homes and office buildings. Also, um, log the birds you see on ebird.org. It's a massive database where you log your bird sightings and it's contributing to conservation and science. Um, and then things like drinking shade grown coffee and keeping your cats indoors. All of them are very important. Um, so please look into that if you are interested in helping birds because we all have to pile on as soon as possible. Otherwise, these declines will continue. And so I, I beg you to do a little research because it's very interesting stuff and there's stuff everybody can do. Hey, let's talk about bird, bird watching now. So backyard birding in a pandemic. So lockdown for the COVID pandemic occurred uh, with spring migration and is still happening clearly with our current lockdowns and social distancing and 
Um, so bird watching really took off. It was already growing exponentially. It's one of the leading causes or leading outdoor activities. Um, and it just blew up, especially when we all had to stay in our homes and were bird watching around our houses. People also flocked to the outdoors, to our public parks and conservation areas and state parks, which is awesome. So Cornell Lab of Ornithologies, Live Bird Cams, their um, website visita- visits were up 45%. Their uploads of bird photos and calls is up 84% through eBird. This is just a boring data dashboard from Merlin, which is a bird ID app on your cell phone. It's a free bird ID app through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And it shows, look at that graph right there. It shows time on the bottom from 2013 to 2020. And those huge spikes are due to COVID. So Merlin and eBird are always growing, but these really peaked during uh, COVID because people were getting into this hobby more and more. So visits to outdoor spaces were up 150% in Missouri, especially to public lands and parks. The global big day um, on May 9th, it's a time when They encourage everybody to go out and count as many birds as they can one day a year. Um, And that was the biggest one on record via eBird and Audubon Society chapter growth has occurred. And so there's just a lot of people going towards birds during time. So winter birding, why should we learn how to bird in the winter? And what does birding really provide for us? Well, it's a great time to start because there are fewer species, a few species only winter here. So we get an influx of a few, a handful of species that only spend the winter here, then they nest up in the boreal in Canada. Um, So we're like their tropical vacation in the winter just to come down to us. Um, Feeders, so birds are a little bit more dependent on feeders than they are during the breeding season. They're not tied to breeding territories, so they move all over the landscape, so they all come to feeders and don't fight as much. Some do, Um, but you put out a feeder and you instantly get birds. It's a direct tie to the outdoors and wildlife. It's a taxa that will show up right by you feeding them. There's fewer distractions because the birds aren't breeding. They aren't singing all over the place. It's a little quieter, so it's a little more approachable because you don't go outside in May to a cacophony of bird song all over the place and try and learn bird ID. That's a little overwhelming. So winter's kind of a uh, kind of a quieter, calmer time of year to start. It's a little more approachable. Also, it's COVID and we're all stuck in our houses. We're all losing it, so why not? <laughs> why not start a new hobby? <laughs> Um, and jokes aside, I know that COVID has been really hard on a lot of our mental health. And this is just one awesome way to direct your um, effort and get rid of some of that stress is to go outside and learn your birds. It's a great thing to throw yourself into and you never get bored. A few notes on equipment. So some people are intimidated um, by the things you have to buy. And so we'll just cover a few things there. Really, the main things you're going to need are binoculars so that you can see the bird's plumage and size and shape and bill shape um, that much closer um, to be able to discern ID and birds far, far away, of course, and a field guide. So binoculars, you don't want to get the cheapest ones because it can cause eye strain and then it won't be any fun because you'll have a headache um, and you won't want to do it again. So spend a little bit of money if you can. Um, Some areas, some nature centers check out um, binoculars once we're able to safely go back to nature centers. Um, so they can provide you a good pair of binoculars for a few hours and then you can give them back. Um, and so with bird apps, everybody has their favorite dog-eared paper field guide that I always take out with me, even if I never look at it. It's always with me and your phone could always die or anything like that. But they also have really cool and free bird ID apps to put on your phone. So I talked about Merlin, which is the Cornell Lab of Ornithologies. Audubon uh, also has a free one. And there's a few that you can pay 10 to $20 for. Um, and some people might think that's a lot for an app. I generally don't spend money on apps for my phone, but I have for bird ID guides because it's just the same amount of money that you would spend on a field guide or a book. And it also has the songs and the calls. And so you're getting something extra than what you would pay for with the book. And it's really handy to keep in your pocket while you're out there. Okay, so let's um, dip our toe into Uh, bird ID. And after this slide, I will hand it over um, to Dana. And so the the theme of this slide is that if you know what any of these silhouettes are on here, you're a birder. I don't put too much stock into only calling yourself a birder after you've identified so-and-so species or that you're only in the club if you've done this or that or the other and identified this many birds or seen this many on your life list, any of that stuff. Um, When you look at these silhouettes, 
which is also provided by Cornell, I believe. Look at these birds. Can you see my cursor, Dana? If I move it around. Okay. So these birds up here, um, you could probably identify as a goose or some form of waterfowl. So these are Canada geese. You would, could identify this one at least to it's a raptor or a hawk um, or some, some bird in that family. Here's one on the wire with a pointy, pointy tail. You may be able to ID that one as a morning dove. Um, this one down here on the fence post looks like an owl. Um, what's this one in the middle? Looks kind of like the shape of a gull that you may see around lakes or reservoirs or um, near the seashore. What's this one on the trunk of the tree? Kind of looks like a woodpecker. Uh, it's using its tail to prop itself up against the tree. And what about this guy with the long, long bill and the little awesome hairdo here? Maybe a great blue heron, or at least you'd know it was a heron or found near water or something like that. And down here's a duck. So my point is, is that you may not feel like you're a birder at all. And you may not, you may feel like you're starting from scratch. And you don't know anything about birds. Well, you probably knew a few on there. So you already, you know a lot more than you think. Um, so now I will turn it over to Dana as we move into basic bird ID. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And I appreciate your conservation message at the beginning and also um, the use of that picture of silhouettes because I too agree that people really do tend to know a little more than they think they do. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think sometimes it gets a little bit overwhelming, particular with, particularly with some families of birds where there might be a lot of similarities in their plumage, um, but you probably can already tell what family, um, as Sarah just demonstrated with the silhouettes, that you can put birds into. And once you've kind of gotten it down to family, um, as demonstrated, it's a lot easier at that point to um, look at some of the more distinctive ID characteristics, field marks we call them, um, and then, you know, consult your app or your field guide based on, on those differences. But it's, it's really important, you know, to start the narrowing down process. Um, and so some of the ways to do that are what we're about to go into here. So basic bird ID. So um, similar to, you know, the silhouettes that, that Sarah just showed, one of the first things that you're going to look at is size and shape. And obviously, you know, size is relative. We'll have a couple of examples later where um, size is a major difference between a couple of species, but that isn't always apparent unless you see them together. Um, but size coupled with shape um, can really be helpful. Then I would suggest that you really get a look at the bird's bill. Um, the, the shape of the bill is going to really help you categorize birds into families. And if you'll click, Sarah. You can click a couple times if you want. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so color, obviously, is going to be super important. Markings are going to be really important. I would caution against looking at color as the first thing that you look at. Um, this is something I know for me, at least, that was definitely um, the, it's the first thing that my eye is drawn to, what color is this bird, but there can be a lot of overlapping colors and even patterns um, between species that actually turn out to be quite dissimilar. Um, and so I encourage you to try and make that like a little bit down on the list of things that you look at first in terms of IDing birds. Um, habitat is really important. There are indeed some species that we consider generalist species that you might see in a variety of different habitats, but a lot of our Missouri birds um, are, are specializing in one or maybe two habitats. And so sometimes if you're kind of waffling between a couple different species, what habitat you are in observing the species might be the determining factor that helps you really nail down the ID. So, and then finally song as well. We're going to play a few bird songs, um, particularly in cases where you're not able to see the bird, song is going to be your best identifier. So as Sarah mentioned that the winter is a great time to um, be able to learn your ID. Some of our wintering species do sing, some of our residents are singing um, year round, but obviously with the leaves off the trees, et cetera, you're going to have better visuals than you are in any other season. Um, so all these combination of factors. So 
We'll talk a little bit about size and shape. If you can go ahead, Sarah. So consider the, the species that are gonna come up here. These are markedly different. And I realize, you know, we're doing this in a photographic format. And so, for instance, that bird on the upper left, um, it's a bird we're going to talk a little bit about later, but it's a very tiny bird. Um, the bird on the lower right is also quite small. And then you can see the other two um, are large birds. But look at the, I mean, the, there are major differences in just their, their overall appearance um, in terms of their shape. Also, check out their postures as well. Um, so these pictures are pretty typical postures for all of these species. Okay, my, my personal favorite, bill size and shape. Um, and these are some very illustrative examples. So you can see the bird on the upper left um, has, a, has a big conical bill. This to me would suggest that this bird is probably um, a, a seed and nut eating bird, it's that bill is going to be able to crush food. Um, and you can see the bird on the right looks like it has a really small bill. Um, and you can see some whiskers probably. Um, so that's one of our night jars. This is an insectivorous bird that flies around um, eating insects in flight. And you can see why it might be very, very good at that um, once it opens its gate. And then Pretty extreme example here with this shoe bill. Um, but you can see, you know, these are these are all wildly different. Um, and you're not always gonna see birds where there's this extreme of difference between bills, but it's a really good thing to focus on. Okay, finally to color. So I think a lot of different birds are gonna come up here. So in the avian taxa we just we have a rainbow of colors on our birds um and sometimes that can be very useful not just in terms of id but also sort of alerting you to the bird's presence in the first place um so the bird in the middle left is our baltimore oriole pretty famous bird i think that a lot of people of all levels um, of birding even folks that don't consider themselves to be bird watchers would know the Baltimore Oriole. It's pretty unmistakable, orange um, and black. And so you can, looking at these, you can also start to see um, the markings and patterns in these different species. And that's gonna become particularly important um, in the winter time and with groups like, for instance, sparrows. So habitat. Um, this is one there's Missouri is is blessed by so many different habitat types, such a diversity um, in ecosystems and in, in natural areas. And so it's a good thing to consider. So you're probably not going to see um, wading birds and shorebirds with a couple of exceptions um, outside of wetland type habitats. So that can help you narrow down your ID as well to family. So here we have some, some prairie specialist birds, um, a dick thistle and a, a northern bobwhite. That northern bobwhite, the quail, is probably going to be familiar to some of you. So these are some typical prairie species here in Missouri. Um, the bobwhite is here year-round. The dick thistle um, migrates to South America. And forest habitat. So um, again, an incredible diversity of birds. Um, you can see, so the, the scarlet tanager that's there at the top, the one that is scarlet with the black wing, is a, you know, obviously that bird is extremely striking. You, if you got a decent look at the bird, you probably wouldn't mistake it for any, any other species. Um, however, the female of that species looks extremely similar to the female summer tanager. Um, so you would have to look more closely if it was a female that you were looking at. And then you can see the other three, um, which going clockwise are red-eyed vireo. Um, what do we have there? Carolina wren? No, too small. Maybe marsh wren. Carolina? No, marsh. <laughs> um, and then a wood thrush. Um, you can see that, you know, there are some similarities at first glance between those species. Um, 
And so you'd want to then, as Sarah suggested with binoculars, making sure that you can get a good view and see some of the field marks um, that we're going to discuss. So one thing to note is a lot of our good field guides, um, such as, so my personal preferences are National Geographic, the newer of the Peterson series, the Sibley Guide are my you know, favorite books, and like Sarah, mine's always on me whether I'm going to use it or not. Um, kind of old school that way. I don't use apps all that much except for song. Um, but a good field guide will also include information about the habitat. So they often also will give you a little bit of a, um, we call it a mnemonic, so a representation of what the bird's song sounds like and some description of habitat. So, um, for example, we have two shorebirds here. The one on the right is a solitary sandpiper acting like a typical um, sandpiper or shorebird, whereas the one on the left is an upland sandpiper, which is actually a prairie species. And so if you are you know, in a prairie and you see this thing that's a shorebird, you might feel surprised, like why this thing looks like it should be in water. Um, but if you consult your field guide, it'll tell you, you know, this is actually a bird of the upland, a bird of prairies. A few other useful features, um, so crest, um, that's pretty self-explanatory, a northern cardinal has a crest um, there on the left, tufted titmouse there in the upper right, and then think about this Carolina run right here. Does it have a crest? Nope. It's a, a good thing to help you with ID. And be thinking about things like the bird's cap if they have a you know a colored cap what what are the coloration and marking of the throat does the bird have a breast spot or not and we'll get into that a little bit more later but you can see um, these arrows are pointing to these portions of birds and again with a lot of field guides usually at the beginning of the field guide they'll have some diagrams simple diagrams of birds and their parts basically um, so that when you refer to your field guide and it tells you something like this bird has a reddish cap and a white superciliary stripe you'll be like what is that um basically it's an eyebrow but your field guide will will let you know that so it's good to get familiar with some of the terminology as well i believe it's back to you my friend yes it is Hello again. So we wanted to go through a few slides here to compare species that you may see out and about while birding and they look sort of kind of similar, at least the same color. But again, we don't want to key in too much on color because that's not going to tell you where to look in your field guide uh, to try and narrow it down. But all of this, let me preface all this by saying all of this takes a lot of practice. We don't expect anybody to walk away from this PowerPoint just a total pro. We don't include all the birds you could possibly see outside. Um, it's just kind of a smattering of uh, different types of families that you may encounter and common ones and just ones that are just here in the winter. Um, but just trying to give you some tools and exposure to some new ones. And so we look at these two birds here. Um, the one on the left is a brown creeper. Um, and we'll go over that one later ID wise. Um, but when you're com when you see this one out in the field, you may notice it has a very slender, slight, small bill um, compared to the one on the right, which has a chunkier bill. It's a sparrow. It's a song sparrow. Um, but they are both brown and streaky. And if you saw these and you aren't uh, an expert birder, you may just think, oh, I saw a brown streaky bird. And that may not help someone if you describe it that way to someone else. So try and key in on like bill size, where the bird was. So on the left, a brown creeper is always going to be creeping uh, on tree trunks or tree limbs, picking out the little insects out from under the bark. Um, the one on the right, the song sparrow, will not be doing that. It will be down on the ground foraging in grasses or it will pop up on a perch, perhaps, if you make a noise or look around what's going on, but it feeds on the ground. Um, you will not see a sparrow climbing up and down tree trunks because it's just not equipped for that. You can see the really long um, toenails on um, this creeper right here for it to grab. You see the same thing on nut hatches. Um, but the sparrow, it's made for ground standing. It's just built different. And so when you describe when you see a bird and you're not sure what it is, really explain like behavior, where it was hanging out. Was it on a tree? Was it on the ground? All of that will kind of help give you clues. So our next one here, our next coupling 
are two birds with bluish on them, and they'll both be found around water. So the one on the left is a belted kingfisher. This is a female. The males will not have the rusty uh, belt across their belly. Um, uh, and if you saw this bird uh, and compare it to the green heron on the right, um, you may describe it differently as, you know, um, the one on the left had a big shaggy crest. Like that's a mondo crest. That's a big crest on a bird. Big shaggy crest. Um, it had some rusty along the middle and some blue and white on the belly. It had a big old bill um, that it clearly may use to spear fish or to grab fish. But the bird on the right has the same type of bill, right, for fish eating. Um, but the one on the right has bright orange legs. It's more skulky. It'll be down towards the water because it feeds right out of the water, whereas the kingfisher will fly down and capture fish out of the water and then fly up to a perch and eat. So, again, all these behaviors kind of feed into... Um, they give you clues. That's why birding is so fun, because it's just like a treasure hunt. And then you get into like nest searching and whew, it's lots of fun. Lots of fun. There's always something new to learn. So these two are, <laughs> some may think are, think are strangely named. So you may notice that they're both perched on trees with their um, little talons there and that they're propped up against the tree using those strong, strong tail feathers. So you may guess that they're both woodpeckers. They both have that big old bill used to drum into trees and pick out insects and break apart wood. Um, the one on the left is a red-headed woodpecker. The one on the right, some people may call a red-headed woodpecker, but it's a red-bellied woodpecker. It has a little reddish wash on its tummy, which you can't really see. Um, plus, its head is a little more orangey. When you see a red-headed woodpecker on the left, you know. It's a crimson red head. They have big, blo solid blocks of black and white color. When they fly, you see those big blocks of color. The red-bellied has that black and white barring. It's a little messier looking um, color-wise. It has black and white barring up and down its back. And it just has this little, like, mullet of <laughs> reddish-orange down its head, as opposed to the red-headed, where its whole head is red. So little things like that. And we'll go over these species more in-depth later. This is another it's great pairing similar, because a, a note yes. on those two woodpeckers too. Yeah. Other yeah. than it's like the red-bellied woodpecker was almost they were named in order to confuse people that are learning birding, in my opinion. Yeah. But also, um, for almost everyone, unless you live, you know, directly next to like a bottomland forest habitat where red-headed woodpeckers um, are quite common, almost everyone is going to have red-bellied woodpeckers as backyard Correct. birds. Um, if, you know, at our place, for example, we get one red-headed woodpecker might show up every couple of years, um, whereas red-bellied woodpeckers are really a lot more common. And so if you see a um, one of these woodpeckers with a striking red head, um, the red-bellied can be very striking, and they're on your suet. Take a good look at the back for those zebra stripes um, and you, because you probably have a red belly. Good call. Yes, that's a good addition. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, one is way more common than the other one, and will show up at your feeder. Yeah. Good call. Okay, this one we're getting a little bit harder here. This one is a little more difficult. If you look at their bills, as we've asked you to do, you can tell that they look the same. But you can also tell that one is a different color than the other one, um, which may give you a clue as to bill color. But other than that, they just like little. They look like little brown birds. Um, which many people describe the whole family of sparrows as. Um, but so they both have the black and white stripes on the head, um, but one has white on the throat, one does not. And one has yellow lores, which again, if you look in the beginning of your field guide, you would learn that that's the patch right in front of the eye. Between the eye and the bill is the lores. One has yellow right here and the other one doesn't. So the one on the left is a white crowned sparrow. The one on the right is a white throated sparrow. So, um, so very descriptive names. But it may not help you if you just see one. The one, the white crown sparrow also has yellow bill uh, adults. And the one on the right, the white throated, does not. Um, so we, we'll talk about those again in depth as we move forward. Okay, so now we're getting into the species where we will describe the plumage to you and the bills and characteristics and the size and shape. Then we will have Sam play our song, and then we'll move to the next species. So that's kind of how we'll go through here. And I'll turn it over to Dana here in a few species. So well, we're going to start off with some of the more common ones that you would see at your feeder. Um, I think that's a good place to start. Uh, so most people, I would assume, but you never want to assume, uh, 
have these birds around their home or have heard them in the woods. They're a very, very common bird. Um, and we have two species here in the state. We have black capped chickadees and Carolina chickadees. And so I'll tell you how you may tell apart the difference here in a minute. These are generalist birds, which means they pretty much use anywhere with trees. Um, so that can be forest, woodland, backyard at your bird feeder. They're actually a cavity nester uh, in the summer in the breeding season, which is really interesting. And they roost in cavities in the winter. And so to tell the difference, it's very nuanced. This again might be a terrible one to start with because people might not see the differences so obviously, but you're not supposed to, it's okay. Um, the one on the left is a black capped chickadee and the one on the right, the two photos on the right are a Carolina chickadee. So I will use my cursor here. Again, I don't expect you to look at a chickadee in a tree and know these differences, but the black capped chickadee generally has a rougher line between the white and the black on its throat patch right there. It has more white in the primaries right here, the primary feathers. The Carolina, it's more gray in the primaries and it has a more straight across delineation between the black and the white. So again, I don't expect you to use those. Song is a good clue. So Sam, I'll have you cue up the song for black capped and it's generally, but we'll have Sam play that. It's our first one. So give us just a sec. That's good. They both go chickadee dee dee dee. Yep. That's great. That's great. Yep. So it has that two note that descending. Carolina generally has four clear notes. They have four. So we'll have Sam play that. that nice okay that's good one way to tell the difference is black cap just has two notes carolina has four some people think it says carolina so that helps you with those four syllables in the song my friend also said it's i will kill you which doesn't help you remember carolina at all i just thought it was hilarious and weird so that's the thing about mnemonics and trying to remember bird songs by adding words to them is my motto is whatever works. If it helps you memorize it, it doesn't matter. If it's the dumbest thing you've ever heard and you don't want to tell anybody, it's okay. If it works for you and helps you know the bird, then that's what matters. Another thing about these species is they hybridize right across the middle of the state. And so if you're anywhere near the middle of the state, you can just say, oh, I'm not sure which one it is. Instead of looking at the white in the primaries, you really can't tell the difference anyway um, because they do hybridize and you can't be sure. So in many, like on an eBird list, and on your bird list, you just write black cap slash Carolina chickadee. You really can't tell the difference. Okay, two other fairly common ones that are generalists. They are both found in forest and woodland. They'll come to your feeder. Um, they're also both cavity nesters and roosters, which we just think is in interesting, which is why we put that on there. Um, these and chickadees are also resident birds, which means they do not migrate. They are here year round. So on the left, we have a tufted titmouse. It is a very common one at feeders as well. It's very loud and gregarious and it, it makes lots of noise at you if it doesn't like you being around. It's really kind of in your face bird. I really kind of like them because they're spunky. So they're gray all along the top. They're white underneath and they have that little rusty yellowish peachy wash on the side under the wings on the flanks. And so they also, it's kind of agreed upon in the bird world that they say, Peter, 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 Peter. So Sam, if you could play that, that'd be great. That's good. Awesome. Thank you. They also play a lot. They also call, have a lot of high pitched call notes that are kind of hard to hear sometimes if you're hard of hearing. But that's their main one is Peter, Peter, Peter. And there's a lot of variation. It can sound really fast or slower. But generally, they say Peter, Peter, Peter. Um, also, please excuse our audio. There might be a little delay, but it's not that big of a deal. But we had we had to figure out a way to play the songs um, through our third party of Sam playing them. So it's working fine. Um, and our next one is white breasted nuthatch. Um, these are really, really cool birds. They just have that beautiful, beautiful slate gray blue backs um, with white underneath. And they have that black stripe that goes down from their bill all the way across that mohawk that goes to the nape of their neck. 
Um, you really can't miss them. They, they like creepers, crawl up and down tree trunks and on branches. They hang upside down and you stick their neck out. They have really limber necks, um, although it doesn't look like they have much of a neck. But um, if we could play that one, Sam. So that one's interesting, and there's a bit of variation with that bird song because I've heard it lower too, of that wah 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 wah, uh, and they'll also make kind of little grunty sounds that are like uh 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 uh, and they'll make lots of different sounds. So a lot of these birds, there's a whole repertoire of the bird of the sounds they make, and some of them even have dialects in different parts of the country. So just to make it more complicated for you, um, but they're really really cool birds, and they're one that you nearly always hear in the woods in the winter. They're very vocal. They always make themselves known, and so they're probably one of the more common ones you hear. Okay, golden crown kinglet. Um, so these, as Dana mentioned before, are itty bitty bitty birds. They're only like this big, so they're going to be teeny tiny ones. If you hear black cat chickadees or titmice, look around because um, a lot of these birds will form foraging flocks in the winter, which means more eyes mean that you can find more food and uh, look out for predators better. So foraging flocks in the winter are really great. And it's one of the only ways when you're in forest to find a lot of birds sometimes, the little bitty guys foraging in the treetops, is if you hear a bird, chase after it, because it's generally not alone. Uh, most of these species won't be by themselves. And so those flocks can be titmice, chickadees, nuthatches, and kinglets here. So these are the itty bitty smallish guys that never sit still. Um, they're going around picking bugs and they flutter a lot when they're picking um, bugs off of branches. So if you see little tiny guys that are fluttering a lot and hardly ever sit still for you to even get your darn binoculars on, those could be golden crown kinglets. They have some yellow in the wing, a white wing bar with black, and they have that yellow stripe down the head, which you won't always see flashed. Sometimes it's uh, flashed when they're agitated and sometimes it's down. Um, but they have like that eyeliner, kind of looks like they have a smoky eye going on. <laughs> Um, and otherwise, they're kind of beige underneath, but they have these little yellow touches and flares. So, um, Sam, I don't know if I gave you that song to play. I don't think I did because they were so high pitched. OK, we don't have that one because they're just really high pitched and it's kind of really hard to hear over the computer. OK, Carolina Wren. So this is this is one of Dana's favorite birds. I feel bad even doing it. Um, so they will hang out in forests. Um, woodlands and draws near brush piles. They like small kind of tight spaces. Um, they're also found in urban areas in your backyard. So they're one of the few, well, they hang out in woods, but also they'll use urban areas if they can find a tucked in little spot. Sometimes they'll make nests in like your boot or an old flower pot or some little crevice or nook on your back porch, like up in your eaves or in a fern on your back porch, some tiny crevice that has a little side opening where they can hunker down in there. Um, they also roost a lot in the winter. I get a lot of pictures every year of two little brown puffs with tails poking out that people find in, at nighttime around their houses. And it's usually two smashed together with little tails sticking out. You can't see their heads. And those are usually wrens that are smashed up next to each other to stay warm um, in the winter. Anyway, their song, they're, they're generally brown overall. They have some cross hatching in the wings. Their tail is usually cocked up. They're, these are another very vocal, gregarious, kind of feisty species um, where if they don't like something, they will tell you about it. They're a wren, you know, has a big, bold, white eye, um, eyebrow um, and a slightly curved bill, um, but very small, compact with a tail that sticks up. So, Sam, if we could play that one. They say tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. And again, sometimes that's fast, sometimes it's slow. A lot of variation with that song. Nice. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Winter wren. This is another clearly wren species. You can tell by its posture. It's a little puff ball with barely a neck, you know, and that tail cocked up um, and ready to go. They're just, wrens are so awesome. They just have so much personality. Um, this species is easier to tell. It doesn't have that bold white eye stripe if you're trying to tell the difference between Carolina and a winter wren. Winter wrens are only here in the winter, which also helps. Um, they'll use dense thickets, brushy fields, um, places where lots of places to hide. Um, but they're kind of cross-hatched all over, including on the breast. You saw with Carolina wren, they kind of have a buffy wash on their belly and their breast. But winter wrens, they're kind of cross-hatched uh, and brownish all the way on the underside of their body. 
but they do have similarities with that brown and black cross hatching. They're smaller, um, but again, look for that eyes, that eyebrow. They don't have that bold white eyebrow. I don't remember if we did the song for this one, Sam, but if we did, if you Nope, no song for this one. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Okay, Eastern Bluebird. It's our state bird, guys. So this species, a lot of people think it's migratory, and the northernmost breeders up in southern Canada will move south um, a little ways, but um, our birds here um, pretty much stay around here. They'll form up a family group and a flock and just move around the landscape looking for resources. Um, so they do not migrate. Some do a short distance again, but they'll generally use open woodland. Um, they're a cavity nester in the breeding season. They form up these small flocks again in their resident birds. Um, just really striking, beautiful little birds. Um, the males are more striking than the females, as is relatively normal in the bird world because um, they have to hide on nests. Um, the males are that dark, dark blue all along the back, and they have that rusty red on the breast and down the sides. And the females are just a little more muted. They have the blue still um, and the rusty, but again, it's just a little bit um, more muted. Other blue birds that could occur in the state are indigo buntings. But again, time of year, look at your range maps and time of year. Um, indigo buntings are only here in the summer. Um, there's a, another species called a blue grosbeak. It's very blue as well, but again, it's only here in the breeding season. So in the winter, the blue birds that you will see are eastern bluebirds most commonly. Okay, we'll go ahead and play that song, Sam. It's kind of gurgly and bounces all over the place. It's kind of hard to describe, actually. Okay, that's good. Thank you. This is their abundance. I'm just showing the that range map. The pinkish red is the breeding season, so you can see our northernmost ones move down a little bit. But we're kind of in the core um, of their year round uh, resident range and surely some birds from farther north come down to winter uh, near and around us. Okay, goldfinch, American goldfinch. These are kind of a toughie because they change outfits between the breeding season and the winter. <laughs> so you might be really excited or, or think, where are the goldfinches this time of year? They're, they're there, they're just hiding. They just change their clothes. So. Uh, goldfinches are seed eaters. They really benefit from leaving your native plants standing in your backyard instead of cutting them all down at the end of the summer after the growing season. We, our backyard is crazy with native plants. It looks really nuts, um, but it helps a lot of pollinators and bird species, including goldfinch. We hear goldfinches back there all the time in the standing dead stuff because they're eating seeds and finding all sorts of little bits of things to, to eat. Um, they're one of the few species that feed their young seeds. Um, so they are our latest nester here in the state. They don't nest until they don't start. Most of our uh, songbirds start in May and go through August. These uh, these birds start in um, July and they will nest into the fall because that's when seeds um, come to head. So that's an interesting tidbit there. Um, but this is what they look like in the breeding season. They're bright, bright yellow. The males are bright yellow with that um, black right on their forehead that doesn't go all the way around their head. It's just right there in between their eyes above their bill. They have black wings and wing bars. The females are a little more um, muted in the breeding season, of course, but again, they have those black uh, wings with white wing bars and white touches um, throughout, but yellow underneath. Um, and then in the winter, they look like generally what they do on the right, just very subtle without the black uh, on the forehead. But if you could go ahead and play that one, Sam, please. They have a lot of variable Twitters um, just all over the place. Really variable. With those little kind of coos in the middle, um, which are really interesting to me. But when you hear them flying, sometimes they say potato chip, potato chip, and finches fly like this, like woodpeckers. They'll flap and then flap and flap. Um, so if you see a bird flying like this and you hear them just say things like tweet, 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 which I think they sound like the stereotypical bird. They're just saying tweet, tweet, tweet. Um, that's what I hear most common anyway. So that's a goldfinch. All right, Dana, I'm handing it over to you because my cue is that it's a brown creeper. So go ahead. 
Well, thank you. I appreciated your description of wrens as puffballs with cocky tails because that's it's very accurate, spot on. Um, one thing that I didn't even think of to add when we were talking about this is that um, I've been noticing lately because we're home a lot more like everyone else. There is some variation in the coloration of goldfinches I've been noticing. It's not, they do look like the picture that you had up there of the drabber plumage, of course, that they that they have during the winter. But we've seen some with kind of a little extra white, some that seem to retain a little bit of the black um, cap, if you will, of the, of the male in the breeding season. Um, and so I just sort of, started realizing that really this winter and so I just wanted to point out to folks that there is a little bit of variation there um anyways going on to creeper which is absolutely one of my favorite birds of all time so we talked about this a little bit earlier right um but I think the photo on the right there is a great representation of the species so if you are looking out and you are looking at a tree and it looks like there's a small piece of bark moving and you are rubbing your eyes being like, what's wrong with my eyes? Um, it's almost certainly a brown creeper because that's really what they look like. They're, they're really very camouflaged when they are creeping up the trunks of um, most trees that they're foraging on. They also have a, a habit of creeping their way and their movements are kind of jerky. Um, as they go up a tree, but they'll spiral up a tree and then they'll fly down to the next tree and spiral up that tree and so on and so forth. Um, and this is another one, Sarah mentioned those mixed for foraging flocks in the winter where there will be chickadees and titmice, um, kinglets. So, and sometimes brown creepers are with them as well. Um, and so just ID wise, you can see, you know, Sarah really talked about this a little bit before, but posture is a really huge one with these, that really slim half needle, half chisel like bill. Um, so how they're foraging is they're actually chiseling up under, under bark to get it goodies in there. Um, Sarah mentioned the tails of woodpeckers being like props, and that is also true of the brown creeper. They don't have quite as stiff and certainly not as short of a tail relatively as a woodpecker. Um, it's longer in comparison to their body than, than woodpeckers are, um, but it, they do use it kind of as a tripod, um, as do woodpeckers. So I don't believe we kept the song on here because it's super high-pitched. It's, it's quiet, it's high-pitched, it's just kind of e. Um, Sam, do I, you I, have it? I do. Well, please, sir. <laughs> Sometimes they get a little bit more melodious. Um, I've heard people describe it as e e e. Can't see me. Um, which is really rather appropriate for their cryptic selves. So great bird. If you can get a good look at this bird, it's really fun to watch. Okay, so um, the first time that I saw this graphic, I actually thought it was a meme, kind of a joke, um, just something to be super cute. And um, there actually are things out there on the internet um, that are trying to be funny and saying that these birds all look super alike. But when I looked at, you know, I took a second double take at this particular graphic and really it is a cute looking thing. Um, but these are very accurate um, in terms of the face markings and go figure, it's the American Birding Association. So they aren't actually trying to confuse anyone. But things like this are, are not just fun to look at but they are pretty good learning tools. So as you sort of look at all of the different markings that are stylized on this rendition of sparrow heads, um, you can see that they're really trying to draw your eye towards markings to focus on. Um, this is a notorious difficult family of birds, particularly for beginners. Um, but I encourage you to really, especially during the winter, this is a great time to know sparrows, especially those that come to your feeder, because basically they'll hang out under your feeder and eat seeds for long periods of time, and you can get good looks at them and really practice and trying to zero in on those those facial and 
markings all over um, that can that can help you with ID. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the white throated sparrow earlier. Um, just trying to throw a little bit more of a wrench into this family for y'all. Um, there are two morphs of this species, um, same species. There's the white morph, which you see there on the left, and the tan morph, um, which is there on the right. This, they have a, the species has a very interesting mating system that has to do with these two morphs. And basically, um, females prefer tan morph males. They are more attentive um, fathers. And males prefer white morph females. Um, so essentially, the white morph is more territorial and can can sort of guard resources better, whereas the tan morph individuals are better parents, basically. Like that's a it's this is a long ongoing study in their Canadian breeding grounds, and I'm really simplifying it, but I think it's really cool um, because they preferentially breed with the opposite morph um, whenever possible. So you can see that the tan morph there is a little less um, distinctively marked, but you can still see that um, that white throat. I know it's got a bit more, you know, it's a bit duller, but that's that's going to be one of your best field markings. Oh, we do have a song, I bet, Sam, if you would. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Um, so as we have written there, people often think of that as saying old Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. And this is a species that will sing um, during the winter time while they're here in Missouri. And it's a really nice, you know, sort of whistly, melodious song. So um, keep an ear out for that. Um, I guess next. Thanks. So our white crown sparrow. Um, in this case, the bird on the right-hand side is an immature, um, a bird that's in its first winter. So again, just to note, this is not male and female. Um, this is this is a, an adult bird and an immature bird. And Sam, if you would play this song, because to me it kind of starts off a little bit like a white-throated sparrow, but then goes into a buzz or a trill, as we have written here. Thank you. So that is another one as well that um, it's a pretty common feeder bird, probably in my experience, not as common as white-throated sparrow, but um, they're definitely around. They will visit feeders and they also will sing during the winter time. Okay. Hmm. So we have here, I'll just, Right off the bat, it's a it's a chipping sparrow on the right hand side of the slide, um, and a uh, American tree sparrow on the left hand side. So this is one of my favorite examples because it's one that I personally messed up pretty ridiculously um, on a Christmas bird count once, and so it was early in my time in Missouri. That's my only defense, but that's not really a great defense once you see the range maps. Um, but I just my eye was drawn to that that red cap on the bird, which to me is a very striking feature of both these species. And so Christmas bird count, I think it was New Year's Day or so, and I saw a sparrow with a red cap and I was like, chipping sparrow, write it down. Um, and my partner, husband, was like, no, I really don't think they're here. I'm like, no, look, this bird's got a red cap. It's definitely a chipping sparrow. He was like, no, no, they're not here. Um, so I learned by then looking at the range maps that it was definitely not. Um, so you can see the differences between these two birds require just a little bit of extra effort in, in studying. Um, yes, they share the red cap, but there are a few different, um, albeit somewhat subtle characteristics um, that set them apart. But one of the things that will really help you out is seeing that the chipping sparrow, um, now the map is on the left, is a bird that is a breeding resident here in Missouri, and they're they're nowhere around 
um, during the winter, whereas American tree sparrows are here in fairly abundant numbers. Dana, one thing that um, I thought made learning my sparrows a lot more approachable, which I still struggle with sparrows. So anybody can struggle with these things, <laughs> no, no doubt. It's just really hard. Um, these families with shorebirds and other little ones with uh, kind of subtle markings are just really, really tough. So don't ever be too hard on yourself about it. But what I do, especially going out for Christmas bird counts in the winter and then going out for like breeding season counts is I make a little list. I go through my field guide and just write down the possibilities for winter. And it's a lot more approachable list when you're only looking at the ones here in winter because it's like six or seven most common ones as opposed to like in your field guide, there's like 20 you know, and so if you just write down the ones in this certain type of year you're going out birding, it just makes it a lot more approachable with these with these species that are really, really tough. That is a super, super good point, um, because one of the things and I'm still learning all the time, too. So if I if there's a family, you mentioned shorebirds, um, shorebirds can be pretty darn tough. I some people are really good at um song and learning the acoustics of birds that's something that's really been hard for me i've found and it just takes a lot of work um so in any season but that's a great suggestion for winter it's to know what the possibilities are so that you're not like just crazily searching through trying to search through your own memory or flipping through the pages of a field guide um with you know not much to go on um, knowing knowing that possibility is is great. That's a great point. So here's a couple of species. Um, as Sarah was talking, I've been listening and sometimes looking out the window because a lot of these species are are right around where I'm sitting right now, um, including purple finch and house finch. Um, this is a we'll get more into um, eruption years and species that come down from the north in large numbers. Um, and the purple finch is one that um, is here every winter, but this winter is here in more in larger numbers than usual. Um, so in terms of their ID, this is another species comparison that for me at least took a really long time. Um, and I'm sure that I probably still make mistakes with it, um, but this one was tough. So purple finch, uh, there on the left. So it is much more of a wine purplish go figure the name raspberry color um than the house finch um obviously there's a there's a d big difference as well in the amount of that purplish reddish color um purple finches have that color covering most of their body so i think that these are great comparison pictures it's often a lot less um the, there's there's often to me a lot less difference than these pictures are showing right here. The house finch there on the right is more when you see them it's it's more of like an orangish red as opposed to the raspberry red of the purple finch. Um but yeah, so check out the sort of the shade of that color, um the extent of that color and also so you'll even see it on better on the females um which we'll see in a in a slide or two but the purple finch has a pretty distinct eyebrow, and you can kind of see that on that male, and the house finch does not have that. Oh, kind of flipped him around there. Okay, so now we've got the purple finch on the right and the house finch on the left there. And you can see again, now you're starting to see the more distinctive facial markings in that purple finch, kind of the stripes of the different pink colors. Um, there's more extensive streaking on the house finch um, there on the left. Um, and then again, the difference in the extent of that purplish reddish color um, and, its, and its location. So females, um, maybe this is weird, but I found the females easier and that's really more how I learned to distinguish these two species. So. That eyebrow that I mentioned, those distinctive facial markings are much more apparent on a female purple finch. And so you can see the differences there um, between the female purple finch on the left and the house finch there on the right. Okay, so here's a, here's a 
very uncommon winter species. We talked about keeping it in or not, and we decided to honestly partially because it's cute. Um, it's a really cute little bird. Um, but also because we wanted to make sure that, you know, they do appear here in the winter sometimes, and we wanted to make sure you all knew about them. Um, because we have another sort of, you know, brown and white streaked bird situation here. A red pole is um, smaller than the two finches that we just talked about. You can see that finer, um, even more pointy bill. And then, of course, the red little front cap there. Um, and then the black under the chin as well. So just something to keep an eye out for. Okay, white-winged and red crossbills. Um, these are another very uncommon um, winter species, but they do come here. Um, so you'll often see, you know, if you if you subscribe to any, you know, birding social media or anything like that, this is, uh, these are species that people will talk about because um, they are pretty rare. But you can see um, the males, well, let's start off with the white wing crossbill is on, on the left there. And you've got the male in the larger picture and then the female in the upper right. And then the red crossbill, um, male on top and female on bottom. And they're called so because their bills are literally crossed. And so what they do is they use those as little little pinchers, little pliers um, to pull uh, pine cone seeds, particularly, um, which they like to forage on. And I don't know, honestly, how often they come to feeders. The bird on the bottom left, that white wing crossbill, that picture is actually from um, my organization's office. Um, one of our employees that live there found this white wing crossbill that, that hung out for, I think, 10 days or something like that and would come and eat seeds under the feeder and um, reliably show up every half hour or so, which was really pretty cool. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, I, I apologize. I'm going to talk even faster because we're kind of running out of time and we still have species to do. So I'll just tell less stories in between. Um, so again, these are two species that we saw before, our red-bellied woodpecker and our red-headed woodpecker. So I won't go too much into the descriptors of its plumage again, um, but as Dana mentioned, the red-bellied is far more common. You'll see it at your suet feeders in your backyard, way more urban areas. Red-headed woodpecker need open park-like structure, so you might see them like nesting in telephone poles in like an open area, um, or as she said, bottom ones, but there needs to be open nests uh, in the canopy and in the forest. Um, so we'll, we'll play those calls. They're very different. The red-bellied woodpecker is kind of like, um, it's really hard to describe. It's kind of like a rolling chur, and they also say chim-cham. If you spend any time outside, I'm sure you hear this. They also go chur, 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 chur. They're like a really reliable vocal bird in the winter if you're outside. Between white-breasted nuthatches and red bellies, you're going to hear them all the time. Red-headed woodpeckers um, subscribe to the prettier of the bird, the uglier the sound. They kind of have like this short little scream that just sounds kind of terrible, but they make up for it in beauty. So go ahead, Sam. <laughs> They're just kind of, ah! it's just like this really harsh scream. And they do lots of other vocalizations when they're communicating with each other. You can find them in really big family groups and just really big groups. If they've found acorns in the winter, there can just be a bunch um, in a certain location if they've found food. Okay, downy and hairy woodpeckers. These two look very similar. One is just much larger, um, but you're clearly not going to see them on the same feeder like this picture. Um, but you can see that hairies are probably almost, you know, they're almost twice the size as downies. But again, size doesn't really count when you only see one bird by itself. So a trick that I tell myself is, and many people use, is that on a downy on the left, the bill is fairly short. It barely sticks out from those small feathers around its bill. And if you somehow, for some weird reason, curved the bill back, it would only cover half of the width of the head. So if you folded the bill back on its head, it would only reach to about halfway across the head. Whereas if you folded back a hairy woodpecker's bill, I don't know where the heck anybody got this. If it's the same width generally as its head, um, its bill is just much larger and sticks out, protrudes much farther than the downy. Um, the males are at the bottom with the red on the back of the head and the females are on the top with no red. 
uh, and the Downies song, they both have a rattle, uh, as some woodpeckers do, um, and their rattle gets faster at the end. So it gets a little longer at the end. And just go ahead and play the Harry too, Sam, please. They sound much higher pitched and harsher. They have a higher squeak. And their rattle is the same speed throughout. Okay. We don't have a rattle with that one, but it's okay. It gets a little, um, it same, stays the same speed instead of going rattle, rattle, and then gets faster towards the end. Again, it's another one that's a little hard to parse out, but just with practice. Um, Yellow-bellied sapsucker is a cool woodpecker. So they they eat sap on living um, sap-producing trees. And so they if you've ever seen little lines like this in the bottom right picture in like perfect rows around a tree, um, they have to keep making those wounds in the tree to produce the sap um, to feed off of it. They're only here in the winter, so they're up in the boreal, as you can imagine, with pines everywhere that produce sap. And then they move down here in the winter. Um, they have that yellow wash, hence the yellow-bellied part. And they have a really striking striped on the head with the red. Males have red on the top and red on the throat, and females have no red on the throat. So um, they kind of have a weird sound for a woodpecker that always kind of throws me off every winter when I hear it. I have to remind myself what it is. But if you could play that one, Sam, please. It's kind of a weird one. And this is a juvenile up at the top. Some people are thrown off by not seeing the red patches. Cool. Another thing with red-headed woodpeckers is if you see juveniles of them, they're not striking red yet. You can see um, the red just coming through on the head, but they're mostly brown on the head before they've lived a full year. Okay, we'll go through a few hawks here. I apologize for going a little bit faster, but we don't want to run out of time, and we want a little bit of time for questions. So sharp shin hawks and Cooper's hawks um, are ones that are very similar and sometimes hard to tell apart. Um, they're very small raptors. They're about the size. Um, sharp shins are a little bit bigger than like a blue jay. So they're pretty small. Sometimes they can come after your birds at your feeder and hang out for a week and then they move on. Um, hawks got to eat too. Um, poor hawks get a bad rap. Um, but sharp shin hawk, they have a very small head in proportion to their body size. So when you look at this bird, it just appears that their head is kind of tiny um, in proportion to this big body. Um, um, they look very similar to Cooper's. They both have this red eye in adults and the dark slaty on the back and the red and white barring on the chest. Um, they also have a squared off tail if you see them flying or perched. It's pretty squared off. It's pretty prominent um, as opposed to a Cooper's, which is grad, um, graduated, which means it, 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 the tail sits in like a curve like my hand rather than just squared off. So small head and squared off tail. A Cooper's hawk, you can see, looks very similar. It's a little bit bigger, but again, that's hard to tell um, when you see them separately. They have a big blocky head that looks a little more proportional to their body. You can see the difference in the head size. Look how small this is compared to this big blocky kind of squared off Cooper's head. And again, the graduated tail, when it sits at rest, it's rounded. And when it's flying, you can see it rounded as well. This is a juvenile. They have those um, vertical kind of blotchy stripes down the chest. And they look similar, too, so you're going to have to go off of tail shape and uh, head size and shape, too, even with juveniles. These are just some quizzes for you. You look at the bird on the left, pretty small head, has a squared off tail. That's a sharp shinned hawk. You look at this one, big, blocky, squared off head um, with a graduated tail, Cooper's. Um, and this one, these are flying, rounded tail, again, Cooper's, bigger head protru protruding farther out. And then a squared off tail um, with a smaller head is a sharp shin. So it just takes practice. Red-tailed hawk. So this is our most common hawk that's this size. So it's pretty big. It's our, it's our biggest hawk, you know, um, largest raptor below an eagle size. So if you see a bird soaring around or perched, it, again, it takes time to learn the size differences just by seeing one bird alone. But it's a pretty hefty hawk. They're perched a lot by the side of the road this time of year, feeding in the in the grassy uh, medians and insides of the road. Uh, many breeding red-tailed hawks up north in Canada will come down and winter here. That's why we see so many more in the winter. They use open country. They perch for long periods of time. 
There's a lot of variation in their plumage, but in general, regardless of what plumage they are, they always have these dark um, underwing bars, these dark, they're called patagial bars. This is um, the bird's shoulder and wrist right here, and the, the bones in the feather are the hand, if you just look at it like that. Um, so this dark bar between the shoulder and the wrist that's always there um, on a red tail. Um, there's a lot of variation between the red and the tail, whether it's a juvenile or uh, an immature or an adult bird. They um, generally all have a belly band, which means they have dark plumage across the belly, but again, that can vary a lot. When they're perched, the light morphs have a white V on the scapular feathers right here, on their scapulars. Um, and so again, this just shows you some variation in the belly band. Some's really, some, is, some are really thick, some are lighter, some tails are very red, some are lighter. Um, this is an adult in the dark morph. Again, there's dark morphs and light morphs in about three different subspecies. So this is a toughie, but again, size-wise, it's one of the only ones that's going to have um, that size and just some of those are helpful clues. A northern harrier is a really cool bird. Um, their face looks like an owl. They have a very flat disc-like face like an owl, um, much like the short-eared owl that we'll do next. Um, but you can see that white around the face is very similar um, to some of the patterns on that northern harrier. So this is a bird of prairies, grasslands, old fields, wetlands, open, open areas, and they, they flap right over top of the grass. So they soar really low. They're not going to soar up high like a red-tailed hawk. They hover over the grass, and then when they see prey, they go after it. The biggest um, factor in identifying this one from afar, if you see it floating along the grass, is the white rump. Um, it has a white patch right at the base of the tail. So if you see that white butt, you know it's a northern harrier. It used to be called a marsh hawk, which is a little more indicative of its habitat. So short-eared owls are one of my favorite, favorite birds in the whole world. They are um, here in the winter only, and they use um, kind of dense, rank grasses in open prairie and grassland. Um, they roost down in the grass during the day, and they come up and fly around to feed uh, in the evening and at night. And if you've ever been on a Christmas bird count in, in a prairie part of the state and your way to find short ears is right before dark, you go out into these grasslands, walk across them, and these birds just float out of the grass like ghosts. And you turn around and there will be like three or four birds flying around that you never heard uh, come out of off their roost. So they're really cool. Again, they have that dislike face like, like our barred owl, and they hunt um, our prairies and grasslands. So um, they're a really, really cool bird. There's one at Bradford Farms right now, and they're all over the prairie portions of the state as well, if you go out there right before dark. Okay, barred owl, um, it's probably our most common owl. Great horned owls are, are also very common in eastern screech owls, but these are, you probably see these most often perched along roads and at the edge of, of forest and, and woodland this time of year, hunting in sometimes grasses, um, but also in the forest. Disc-like face, very white. Um, they don't have those ear tufts like great horned owls do. Um, they're pretty easy to tell apart from the other owls with size um, and with that disc-like face. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Dana to talk about eruptive species. So Sarah and Austin, I'm just going to go super fast. We just kind of want to make sure that um, folks know that these are possibilities. They might be something that you've heard about since we are having an, an eruption year for several species right now. Um, and it kind of varies. So basically, um, these are species that either come down to Missouri in small but regular numbers or not at all. Um, in, a, in an eruption, they show up in very big numbers. Um, so there's a couple of examples. Um, I already said that purple finches are kind of having an eruption year. They're here in larger numbers um, than they are usually. Um, snowy owl, this happens. Some of some folks might have heard, I think it was a couple years ago, and then it was like four or five years before that. Um, they were down here in really big numbers. This is pretty much an unmistakable bird. I can't imagine if you see one, you're gonna know <laughs> what it is. So go ahead, Sarah. Red-breasted nuthatch. We've talked a little bit about the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, so this is very closely related bird. Um, sometimes come down in small numbers, um, but in eruption years, again, quite large numbers. And um, I know that in some of Sarah's uh, brown-headed nuthatch study sites down in the Ozarks, 
this year, particularly during an eruption year, this the red-breasted nuthatch is extremely, extremely abundant um, and sometimes gives their opinion on what Sarah is doing with brown-headed nuthatches. <laughs> um, so just one to watch out for. It's a little bit smaller than our white-breasted nuthatch that you'll see a lot. You can see the there's some pretty striking head markings on this bird, um, and we have a male on the right and a female on the left. And then we can go to next. Pine siskin. Okay, so this is another one that is having a big eruption year this year. The bird you are most likely probably to confuse it with is a um, American goldfinch, but see how streaky this bird is. So when you see a bird that you're like, huh, that's the size of a goldfinch, the relative shapes are really similar, they're at the feeders um, with goldfinches, look at all the streakiness. Um, there's a varying, there's going to be a very amount, varying amount of yellow that you will see when you see individuals of the species, but that streakiness and also if you get a good look, that that bill is conical at the base and then comes down to a really small point and it's a finer um, bill than the than the American goldfinch. But I think you have a screenshot. Yep, <laughs> pine siskins have taken over the country. So this is a post from Audubon in late October of 2020. So it's a it's a big year for these guys. And then finally, evening grosbeak. Um, I'm not the person to be speaking of this species because much to my extreme dismay, I have never seen one in my life. I'm waiting for them to come to my feeder because um, they are here in Missouri this year. Um, my understanding is that they like sort of the open platform seed feeders quite a lot. Um, and I really can't wait to see one. So um, really neat looking bird. But this is a bird that again, um, if you see it during, you know, during the winter time, especially if it's a feeder situation, I don't, I don't believe you're going to mistake it for anything else. And I think that's it for eruptors. Cool. That was quick. That was quick. Yes. Austin, do you want me to do this mini quiz or, or do you just want, should we just go to questions? Do we have a lot of questions or what do you want to do? Oh, you're muted. The quote of 2020, you're muted. Maybe just go ahead and run through the quiz and let them know what they're looking at, and then we can. Uh, we don't have a lot of questions, and most of mine I've taken care of, so I think we, we probably should be good. Sounds good. Thank you for doing that so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody. So just think of the answer in your head. I'll give you a few seconds. But on number one here, we have a big blocky head. We know it's either a Cooper's or a Sharp Shin, right? We've narrowed it down to those in general. It has a big blocky head, and it has a rounded, graduated tail. Its head looks pretty proportional to its body. It is a Cooper's. Everybody said Cooper's. I know you did. And if you didn't, that's okay, too. Um, this one, number two, um, it has those dark patagial bars right here out on the leading edge of the wing. It has a little bit of a belly band. It's got a red tail. It is a red-tailed hawk. <laughs> you guess red-tailed hawk. You are right. All right, this one is a is a toughy but has a squared off tail it's a juvenile cooper's or sharp shin has a squared off tail it has a small head that's hardly protruding out past the wings so square tail small head is a dana <laughs> sharp shin it's a sharp shin great job you've learned a lot on this bird <laughs> i webinar. have i have those are tough <laughs> okay number four it looks kind of like a red-headed woodpecker to me. Uh, it has red on the head, I know. Oh, Jane is giving me the thumbs down. It is a red-bellied. And in this picture, you could see the red wash on the belly. Whoever named this bird um, should be punished. Um, but you can see the black and white barring on the bat on its back and kind of its um, reddish-orange mullet. So it is a red-bellied woodpecker. Number five is Tuffy. It's one of two things, which Dana went over. It's either a purple finch or a house finch. Dana, what do you think it is? That's a tough one. That's a tough view. I think because of the extent of the red and the additional streaking on the on the sides and belly, I'm going to say house finch. I agree. Yes, it's a house finch. And it doesn't, again, as Dana mentioned, which is such a great ID feature, it doesn't have the stripes on the face. It doesn't have, like, the different... Uh, 
barring because this one's kind of tough for me it looks like it has a lot of red it looks wine stained but it has that extensive brown uh, streaking on the sides and it doesn't have those stripes on the face which are a really good thing to key in on okay number six we just did this one it's an eruptive species they're everywhere it's not goldfinch it's a pine siskin because of all this streaky all over the place even though it has some yellow like goldfinches do okay number seven Remember, go back. It's one of two species. It's our hairy or downy woodpecker. It has a pretty long bill. If you folded it back, it's about the width of its head. Um, we know it's a male with the red on the back, don't we? It's a hairy. It's a hairy woodpecker because it has that really long, long bill. Okay, so that's our mini quiz. And just one thing I want to tell you about is this quiz on eBird, ebird.org slash quiz. It's an easy one to remember. And this is a cool quiz. You click start and then you put in your location and when you're birding. So you can only get winter birds near me or you can only get winter birds in Louisiana. You can pick any location uh, in different times of year, summer, spring, whatever. You pick the date literally on a calendar. You pick whether you want to be quizzed by photos or sounds. And then you're shown a bird and it's multiple choice. You pick which one or you're played a song and you pick. So it, it's always new every single time because they're using Macaulay Library images people upload through eBird. So there's just no end to these images and sounds and it goes on forever. And then to go to the next species, you click the quality of the photo. So it's a way to crowdsource how good people's photos are in Macaulay Library. So it's kind of genius, but it's great and it's always different every single time you do it. So I apologize for taking so much of your time. I know we said till 4.30, but we don't have a ton of time for questions. But again, thank you, thank you, thank you to Austin for fielding all of our questions and for hosting us, to Dana for being such a rad co-host and a fun friend to do these with. And thanks to everybody who logged on and spent an hour and a half of your life with us talking about uh, winter birds.